Um, thank you for the introduction. Thanks, Hector. So yeah, uh, I was here in May to give a workshop for about a week. It was really, really great to be back here. So I'm just going to get straight into it. I'm also really happy to be here with, with Anna and Memo, good friends. I uh, do a lot of events together, so I'm looking forward to our talk later. So I'm an artist, a programmer. Um, all my work is here. And I'll just kind of tell you a bit about my background and kind of show you some work. So uh, I first became interested in machine learning in the context of music technology. So first, I was first interested in, I was kind of a music, like music snob in college. I was really interested in new music. And I got interested in this idea of recommendation systems, collaborative filtering, and all these kinds of techniques for uh, recommending music that I might like. Um, and within that ecosystem, there's a lot of people who are interested in more artistic, um, more artistic and creative practice for, for machine learning in the context of music, right? Because there's a lot of musicians and, of course, people are interested in production tools and composition and things like that. I started uh, working with my friend Jeff Snyder on building these uh, electronic musical instruments. And then, you know, this is just this kind of electronic flute that you see. It doesn't make any sound. It's just a controller. And so the idea was to hook it up to some sort of a digital synthesizer and then use machine learning to allow a musician to specify the kind of input sensor, sensory input to output synthesis parameters mapping. Um, I think that's a really, that's a very long-winded way of saying that like you can make your own musical instruments basically and kind of invert the relationship that you know, a performance artist may have with their instrument. You know, you can, instead of having to spend 15, 20 years learning how to make a violin make sound, like I still can't make a violin make sound personally, um, instead, you kind of invert that and let a musician say, I want the music to sound like this when I hold the instrument this way. And then you kind of use machine learning to, to figure that out. Um, over time, I became more and more interested in the visual arts as well, and new media arts and interactivity. I started doing creative coding. And uh, over the last couple of years, machine learning has, has uh, un unexpectedly for me like become very interested to, to new media arts, which was always kind of a very separate thing for me. And so I've kind of doubled down my efforts on, on um, you know, this intersection. And I've been trying to formulate like some kind of a, um, a reasoning for why it, machine learning is so interesting to artists, or at least to me. And I think it has something to do with this. Like I, I, I've always thought of, uh, I've always thought that machine learning gives us a very, very crude instrument, very, very crude for uh, maybe capturing something about like our collective, you know, our collective unconscious, right? Or maybe, as I like to call it, our collective imagination, right? There's the idea is that we have this cognitive endowment that we all share, you know, as human beings that is, you know, passed on, passed on over evolution, right? And this gives us, you know, we all collect all these images together and then we label them and we put tags on them and all this kind of, all this kind of cognitive work goes into, into these uh, images and then we can kind of, I don't know, like uh, regenerate them or recapitulate them somehow. And so I, I think that, you know, generative models in particular, which I'll talk about later, are, um, you know, are maybe like just the beginnings of a, of a window into this. And, and like I said, a very crude one. I don't want to make a case that this, as you can see, this is, doesn't necessarily give, give us the most realistic picture, but maybe you can think of it as like the first telescope in the 16th or whatever it was, the 17th, 16th century for looking at things like the quasars or something, right? It's like we're not there yet, but maybe this is kind of a path forward. Um, I'm going to take the liberty of introducing neural networks very, very briefly because I think all of us here in the panel will talk about these in one form or another. Um, I'm going to be very brief, but but hopefully this kind of gives you enough of a picture to, to understand the rest of what follows. Neural networks are these machine learning algorithms for essentially mapping one kind of data into another kind of data. So usually this is in the context of something like the most standard thing is, is image classification. So you get a picture of a dog, it goes through a whole bunch of multiplications and additions, and it tells you that, that it's a dog, right? Because there's 10 output neurons that correspond to dog, cat, milk carton, microphone, telephone, things like that. And um, one of those labels stands for dog and it has, and it has the most signal at the, end of the, at the end of the, you know, the input to output process. And so then you decide it's a dog. But why can be anything, right? Why doesn't have to, why can be a whole set of pixels? It can be a sentence, it could be audio, it could be all sorts of things. So these things are very, very generic containers for transforming information, right? And 
Uh, one really important, uh, also I should say, neural networks are typically a lot more, lot larger than this, and a lot more complex. So we've developed neural networks that can have sometimes dozens or even hundreds of layers, and they have all kinds of very specialized layers that do, that do kind of maybe more customized processes. So like one very typical one is convolution, which I'll show you in a moment. Um, but in any case, like they. They become increasingly large, like they'll take up many hundreds of megabytes uh, if you download one of these. So I'm going to show you a very quick demo that'll show you the process of a convolutional neural network in the browser. Oops. Uh, no, not not my email. <laughs> Hold on a second. Cubnet viewer. Uh, let's try this one. So this is basically. Okay, convolutional covenant. Uh, great. Okay, so um, so this is a covenant convolutional neural network running in my browser, and basically what it goes through is a series of transformations of the input data, right? So you get this webcam stream, and there's a whole bunch of these filters that are looking for small patterns inside of the image, right? So patterns that are you know, just a shade of some color, or maybe like parallel lines or corners or something like that. And it goes through a series of transformations, until, um, and you get these, these sort of activation maps. I don't know if you can tell, but like, I'm in there, right? And it shows the presence of a particular pattern inside of the image. And what happens is that you do this multiple times. So this, all of these activation maps get concatenated into a new input. And that goes through a new convolutional layer, which finds new patterns inside of the image. And this happens multiple times. And like very briefly, um, what, what this means is that at each stage, it's able to capture more and more high-level patterns. So it starts with very, very simple things like edges and corners, maybe parallel lines or something like that. And then it combines those into primitive shapes, squares, rectangles. Um, and then into more primitive, maybe slightly more complex shapes, right? And eventually into more kind of primitive objects, windows, doors, um, things like that, uh, until you're able to get very, very high level objects. So here, I'll give you an example. My favorite one, which I always show, conv for 156. Yeah, where's that? That's right here. Can you tell what that one is? Right. So it's a face neuron, right? It's, it seems to be looking for a face, which is interesting because we never told it to do that. It just kind of, well, it, it found that it was useful for the task that it was trained for because it's trained to detect people and cars and objects and animals. And so it learned that a lot of things that you wanted to detect have faces. And so in this sort of unsupervised way, it learned to look for faces in order to um, you know, do its job effectively. And then finally, at the end, we can do classification, right? So if I put my put my phone in front of it, it'll go iPod, you know, stupid, stupid neural network. It's an iPhone, right? But uh, and also like I don't know, microphone. It's usually pretty good with the microphone. Drumstick, much, much better. So you can see that it's it's uh, and th these things have become incre increasingly, uh, yeah. Sleep on the other side. Um, you can see that these things, yeah, they work. They work pretty well. So, what are some fun things that we can do with them, right? Um, well, uh, one thing that's happened over the last maybe five, ten years or so is that people have become interested in knowing a little bit more what happens inside of neural networks because um, it used to be that you would do a lot of sort of handcrafted engineering and then plug in the features that you found from standard computer vision into a shallow neural network. And then you would do you know, classification or whatever. But now we go directly from pixels to output. And instead of thinking of this as just a black box, we want to know what's inside of it. And so there have been experiments since at least like the, uh, for at least like the last five years or so doing things like this. So this is some work by Zeiler and Fergus at NYU in 2013, where they isolate regions of actual images which maximally activate a particular neuron in the neural network, right? So like the example I showed with the face, right? That's a neuron that's looking for a face, or, or as we interpret it that way. Um, and you can do this at any neuron and try to analyze, try to, try to figure out what is it actually looking for. And you can see that some neurons look for kind of circular objects. Some neurons like, I don't know, parallel lines or threads 
or just weird patches of yellow. At a higher layer, you start to get more complex things like lattices, right? This is, these are kind of lattices. Car wheels, that's a nice car wheel neuron. Torsos, maybe, uh, upper bodies, things like that. This one's kind of neat, it's text. So you see like, you know, rectangles and barcodes and text of different languages. Um, and so that's, that's one way of getting to it. Another way, uh, which is much more interesting to, to me as an artist, is, is this way. And this, this is some research that goes back already a good solid nine, eight, nine, eight, nine years or so, which is actually trying to synthesize images from scratch, which maximally activate a particular neural, neural network, right? So maybe if you take this image, right, which, which looks like nothing to us, sort of, but if you make this image and then send it through a particular neural network that has a, uh, has a bell pepper classification, um, it's going to make the bell pepper neuron activate. It's going to excite it very much because it has features of what looks like a bell pepper, right? And this is like a, a limousine, you kind of see some wheels here, lemons, things like that, right? Uh, this is the cat neuron, right? Of course, you can see um, face neuron, things like that. And um, so this is already nine, eight, nine years ago. And it's a very interesting technique. And it's been de developed and kind of um, refined over the years. And, and probably the first time this technique came to wider attention was in 2015 with the publication of Deep Dream. So maybe some of you might have uh, recalled when, when um, three researchers at Google uh, came up with, it, with this Deep Dream technique. So first they described this, the technique that I just introduced to you, maximally activating Neur uh, particular neuron and neural, neural network. So you have you know your ants and your starfish layers and your parachute, not layers, neurons, uh, banana neuron, things like that. And they refined the technique so that it started looking a little bit more coherent uh, and a little bit more colorful, let's say. And um, but then they kind of did this this interesting thing where they decided, uh, for for purely artistic purposes, more or less, to to change this uh, technique very ever so slightly. So the idea is. You're still trying to optimize the pixels to reach some particular state of activations in the neural network. But now, instead of demanding that you get only one particular neuron, you know, your parachute or your, your screws or your starfish or whatever, you instead pass the image to, into a neural network, like a real image. And then whatever activations it has, you change the pixels so as to make the activations become higher. You enhance them, right? So whatever the network thinks it's seeing, it will see more of it or make more of it, right? And this is this is hallucination in the in the you know in in kind of the literal sense. It's kind of what happens when 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 we're hallucinating, um, or well, not to get too personal, but at least when I hallucinate. Um, now, uh, I've been really interested in this technique, and um, and Alex Mordensev is the developer of this technique. He's a he's a researcher at Google, and he started making crazy art. With this, right, and 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 uh, well, yeah, this this really interested me. And this, I think, this was the, the time that this technique, which was really a purely scientific technique, you know, for for basically stimulating neural networks and trying to figure out what what's inside of them, became more of a creative tool, right? And and he started posting things like this. His cohort at Google, Mike Tyka, uh, also began to to try to extend this to, uh, way, extend this in various ways he introduced these techniques for making videos and I'll show you a couple of them in a second and started making all these you know amazing graphics like this and for my part I've been really interested in trying to add more compositional tools like in in the sense because you know deep dream kind of takes away a lot of the gears that artists are used to having you know a lot of the control over what the final aesthetic is and so I thought it would be interesting to be able to compose with different parts of the neural network. And one way that you can achieve this is by using masks. So basically, this, is, this technique, this deep dream technique is iterative. So you start with some input image, and then you gradually change the pixels ever so slightly, iteratively, in many, many iterations, uh, until it you know, reaches this final state. And so what you could do is you can kind of intervene. So in, during the iterations, you get this signal like add this much to this pixel and add this much to this pixel. And so what I would do is multiply them by masks. So to, I would maybe try to optimize two neurons at the same time and then have all of the gradient for one pass through in the left and all of the gradient for the other pass through in the right. And in the middle, you would give a little bit of each. And what happens is that, that, the, uh, that the process seems to kind of like try to find features that satisfy both neurons at the same time. And so you start to get things, these kinds of patterns. 
So you can basically do a composition with these, right? So here's some examples. There's two neurons that are being optimized here, and there's a mask that's kind of like what you saw, just, just a sort of a crossfade in, in a sense. You can set up masks in other ways, like here's the masks are concentric circles. And also, as Mike Tyke introduced this technique for creating video, I started making video. And the video is a feedback loop. So you make an image, and then that becomes the input to the next round of deep dream. And maybe you distort the canvas a little bit. You can maybe crop it, or you could rotate it, and then you'll get a new image every time. And these take a lot longer to make, but they, uh, well, but they seem to work. Um, a little while ago, I was like trying to figure out how to make longer videos on Twitter. Like this is this is really what I spend my time doing, basically. And I figured out a way to loop, make these these videos loop. So these actually like it may not appear like so, but these are actually just three seconds long. And I figured out this technique for basically it's very popular. Generative artists love to make things loop because then you don't realize that the video ended like ten minutes ago, and you just keep on watching it. Uh, and and uh, but they usually do it in very sort of procedural ways. They'll make something rotate 360 degrees, or you know, rotate 180 degrees, or something like that. And here, I really like that the that the network just figures out ways of like blending the features over time so that it doesn't really appear to ever stop. Um, this uh, is closely related to this idea. So so the um, deep dream is closely related to this idea of style transfer. So you can do you can take the style of a particular image and then try to synthesize that. Um, and uh, and what I've been, become really interested in is this idea of texture synthesis, which is taking the style of a particular image and then synthesizing that without any content, which is kind of what style transfer is known for. So this is this is like I'm sure you recognize the source texture. Um, you might even recognize the city, but 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 don't try to go there. Um, it's it's based on San Francisco. Um, but uh, but yeah, so you can make these like texture synthesis using this technique and apply this looping technique. So this is kind of what I imagine like if you've ever had a nightmare and you're like looking at your phone and trying to zoom in into, into, into Google Maps, this is what I imagine it kind of looks like. Just kind of like Google Maps of my nightmares. You could It works like really well with, with pretty much any source texture. So this is, you probably recognize the Great Wave of Kanagawa, the 19th century Japanese uh, woodcut going in the loop itself. This is Composition 8 by, by Kandinsky. And again, just going in a nice like three second loop in the continual spiral. Um, you can do all sorts of things to this. So I've been trying to make collages um, of different painters. So you get like 20, 20 paintings by, by a particular painter and then just like mix them up in a big salad and then just like splatter them on the page. And so of course Jackson Pollock Needs no explanation. This kind of looks looks as you might expect it. Frida Kahlo. Um, Frida Kahlo is very well known for for making self portraits. So you kind of see some loose eyebrows and kind of noses here and there. Um, Salvador Dali. There's the melting clocks, of course. He's particularly known for. George O'Keefe made a lot of flowers, and so you can kind of get a, like a general gist of that. Okay, generative models. So this is this is what I'm really excited to talk about, as I mentioned earlier. Generative models are neural networks that produce images directly. So Deep Dream isn't a generative model because it's actually like this sort of algorithm, this optimization-based technique that uh, uses a neural network as a sort of like critic or something like that, like an analyzer. Generative models, in contrast, are actually neural networks that produce images altogether. They, they synthesize images as their outputs. And uh, they've become increasingly realistic over the last few years. And they're, and they're, they're really the, the, probably the, the thing that has, the, the reason why all of us are here, basically. Like without, maybe that's an exaggeration, but they're really uh, responsible for all of the realism that you see in, in the media about this kind of stuff. They're making things like, yeah, cats, mostly cats, like, of course. Uh, but also TV screens and cars. And they've been interesting for a long time to the scientists because uh, I think this Richard Feynman quote kind of captures it well. What I cannot create, I do not understand, right? And the idea is that by trying to synthesize, try, trying to generate a data set that you're interested in is in some sense learning what it is, like, or how it works, right? Finding the underlying structures of it. And so um, they become, yeah, increasingly complex. I've watched them go from like four pixels, literally four by four pixels, into behemoths, which you'll see in just a second. The idea of generative models is that you have a neural network, let's, you know, and it's much bigger than this, typically very big, um, and, 
and it, it's trained on many, many, often millions, like at least thousands of images of a particular thing that you want to model. And the network is structured in a way where you basically have some input vector, which we call a latent input or a latent vector, something like that, which uh, it's a neural network that takes as its input this basically kind of like fairy dust. I think of it as fairy dust. It's just like a vector of random numbers. And out on the other side, you get a, an image, like an image that corresponds to, these to this vector. And if you modulate the vector slightly, you get slight changes in the output itself. So um, this gives you a way of kind of like tuning the output, you know, trying to modulate the high level parameters, right? There's kind of, um, not, not to be too pedantic about it, but like the two most prevalent uh, classes of these are called autoencoders, variational autoencoders typically, like which is what you see here, which are kind of these like compression devices. So the idea is you make a neural network, figure out how to compress data, and then decompress it. And by doing that, you force the network to learn this very high-level representation of the high-level features of the data set. And then, and then you take the decoder, and you, you can basically just plug in random numbers and synthesize images. And then the second version of this, which, is, uh, which was only developed in 2014, is called a generative adversarial network, GANs, sometimes you see, which uh, are, have mostly taken up most of the mantle uh, in the last few years. They're kind of really weird, and mathematicians hate them. but. They, they work really well. And the idea is that you have two networks, a generator and a discriminator. And the generator basically synthesizes images. It's like the decoder, basically, in an autoencoder. And the, the discriminator says if the image is authentic or not, if it came from the generator or if it came from the data set. And by, by training them in this sort of battle, where they're, they're the, hence adversarial, they're trained against each other, it turns out that this does a really, really great job of making, making the generator learn how to make very realistic looking images. And gener generative adversarial networks have, have gone from this, this is late 2015, generating faces at, at something, like 20, uh, something like 32 by 32 pixels into, you'll see in a few slides, like increasingly high definition, things like that. Um, these guys, uh, Radford et al, uh, figured out how to, how to um, use convolutional and deconvolutional layers inside of GANs like as, uh, as, as recently as three years ago. This was, this was at the end of 2015, so this is just a little bit more than three years ago. And they talked about how you can, you can do arithmetic on the feature space, right? So if you have the latent vector which produces what looks like a man with glasses, and then you find the latent vector that produces man, like man without glasses, you subtract it, and then you add the vector which produces woman without glasses, um, you get man with glasses minus man plus woman equals woman with glasses. So you can basically do arithmetic on the features and, and kind of compose with them. So this is really, really like mind-blowing to me. Um, I, I, um, so immediately, like I thought I was doing a lot of work with handwriting at the time, handwriting and kind of characters and text, and I found this data set uh, of, of handwritten Chinese characters, right, that should yeah, that, that was being collected like basically for the purposes of optical character recognition um, by, by this university in China. And I thought, I have a better idea for these. Like, I'm gonna <laughs> so I got, I got permission to use the data set, and I trained one of these DC GANs on, on this data set of, these are actual samples, so made by, written by people. Um, and what happened was I, uh, you, I was able to train a DC GAN to produce, actual, to produce characters that look real. So these, in these pairs, the character on the left is real, the one on the right is fake. Um, by the way, how much time do I have? Like, what time do I go until? Ten minutes. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Now I'm going to skip some of this. Um, so basically, you could do things like this: synthesize characters, like um, modulate the, the the input vectors, and so on. And uh, you can also do interpolations between characters, right? So you go people to culture, right? Or recognize, remember, learn. And you see that every character in between looks like it almost could be an authentic Chinese character. And so like, I like to think of this as sort of like, like, like all the characters that we have are just points in this conceptual space. You know? And then by accident of history, we don't have a, a character for whatever the concept between people and culture is. But maybe this you know, could have been one, right? Um, now, like I said, like GANs have become increasingly high, high level. Uh, uh, high, high dimensional, right? So this is some work by NVIDIA, like about a year ago, 
um, called progressively grown GANs, where they figured out how to do these things at 1,024 pixels, increasingly high realistic looking faces with stubble and, you know, like the glint in people's eyes and strands of hair and so on. And um, really, really unbelievably like realistic. And so I decided to try to train one of these. It's extremely hard to do because they require like eight GPUs for like three days or something like that, or one GPU for a month. It's like really, really, really yeah, hard. But anyway, I downloaded a data set of paintings from WikiArt, which is a collection of, of public domain paintings, and basically trained one of these uh, one of these progressive GANs on top of it. And you see how much capacity it has to store different kinds of paintings. You know, you see these portraits and landscapes, abstract works like document archives. Um, I don't know what this is, like some globular abstract thing. And you can do this kind of cruising the latent space, right? So you can make, you know, 10 million paintings out of one model. Um, and it's just like this, and I can make this forever, basically. It's like, it's this, it produces such an abundance of artworks that it's, that it's, that some, somehow, like, well, post-scarcity, right? Like, indeed, I guess. I don't know. But in any case, I can watch this all day, but I, I'm running out of time, so I want to, I want to show you a few more things. Um, increase, more and more complex, so, like, um, this was just a few months ago by DeepMind. These are just 512 pixels, but this is not a real dog. This is a totally generative dog, and so hyper-realism is, like, on its way to, to machine learning. Um, yeah, the, these guys really, really did a um, pretty, pretty crazy job. So fake looking dogs and bubbles and rockets and things like that. Um, a lot of us have been playing with these. Like you've probably seen these online a little bit. And I made a notebook that you can actually make some of these yourself. I'm going to show you a few fun things that I did with them. So like I said, you can do interpolations between classes. So I thought it would be funny to see what's halfway between a dog and an owl. Right. So here's your, your owl and here's your dog and then here's your 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 owl dog right this is your generative owl dog here's another one owl plus dog this looks like a character from harry potter doesn't it like like i want to i want to caption this someone name it give it a name like anyway um cat the, I, I guess like that cat and the owl become what looks like a snow leopard this is like some sort of a mop dog i don't know what it is a crown, like you can combine owls with anything. I don't know, like the owls work so well for me, so I just did owls and everything. Sea lions and dogs. Um, I love this. This is a whale, like an orca, and a tram. And so it be, it looks, it makes a fairy basically. It's like, <laughs> so it's an, <laughs> and I don't know what that is, a goblet or something. Oh, another fun thing you can do is, so I did this technique where I regenerated a video with Big Gen. So here's the idea. The thing on the left is a video from planet Earth, and I take the video and I process each frame in the following way. I pass it through a neural network which is telling me what, what the probabilities of all these classes are. There's a thousand of them. And I take that vector and I, see that I, put, I input that into BigGen. So I try to regenerate those class, those class probabilities, right? So what it thinks it sees a bird and it generates a bird. And it works really well for animals. Doesn't work so well for everything, but um, but it works great for animals. So I kind of thought I would just do this with planet Earth. So you can see, like, okay, mushrooms. Yeah, why not? You know, sprouting. Anyway, um, let's see here. I want to. I'll just say a few things about about image to image stuff. So this is these are generative models that take an input image. So basically, they're like image filters. They're like really, really, really crazy image filters. So for example, like a day to night filter, right? You can take an image in the daytime and turn it into the nighttime, turn edges into photos. This has been around for a couple of years now. And I've done a couple of projects with this, including like a sort of city style transfer. I don't have enough time to talk about this, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of skip this. But you can generate your own fantasy landscapes, basically from, from input maps. Um, another thing you could do with it is make face basically imitate people's faces. So the idea is like with pix to pix you have this twin data set of face markers and faces and you train it to go from the face markers like this to this and then you put yourself in front of the camera. I've done this as an installation a, a bunch of times and basically extract your own face and then run it through the generative model and make, you know, Voldemort basically. Um, and so this is this has actually been a little bit better now. You can do almost HD um, this is just from a few, maybe six months ago or something like that. 
And it, these are, this is my hacked version of this, basically. If you want to see where NVIDIA is with this, it's here. Like, this is some work by NVIDIA making unbelievably realistic looking faces. You're going to see these in video games, I think, pretty much, pretty much this year, probably. And, um, and in the future, it's basically going to be like your TV news anchors, your, your sitcoms, your, maybe your movies. Uh, I know in like Japan, they already have completely virtual pop stars. And so this is going to be like everywhere, I think, pretty, pretty soon. Um, not to be too dystopian about it. Another cool thing I just want to mention briefly about Cycle again, which is the same thing as Pix to Pix, except, um, it, uh, except it doesn't require images to be paired. So you basically, like with Pix to Pix, you need like pairs of things, right? So like, let's say you wanted to make a horse to zebra, like this, this horse to zebra filter. Well, that would be really difficult with Pix to Pix because it would require getting a data set of horses and zebras in the exact same position. And I don't know if you've ever tried to make zebras pose, but they are like not into that. So you, so with CycleGAN, it gets rid of the requirement that you have pairs of examples. You just have a folder of horses and a folder of zebras, and it learns basically, you know, that you want to convert horses into zebras. And it's still a developing technique. It doesn't work quite as well as Pix to Pix for a lot of things. It makes a lot of like really funny mistakes, like this. So here's your zebra filter. Um, but but it is it is kind of like yeah, it's coming up. Um, Okay, another thing I want to show you, a few minutes left, Glow. This is a generative model that lets you invert images. Basically, generative models sometimes, like, we want to place in a real image into the generative space so we can do operations on it. And Glow is invertible. So the generator is invertible, which means that you can take an image and encode it into the latent variable that produced the image. I know that's, like, maybe a little... I'll, I'll show you later, like, if you want to know more about what I'm talking about. Like, I have, like, 30 hours of this. But basically, like, you can do operations on these. And so I could do things like make my hair blonde, put glasses on myself, heavy makeup, eyeliner, and, and do these interpolations. You could also do like encode two images, including this like, you know, cute Canadian pop star, maybe not particularly well known here, and then do like face face interpolations. And so so this is like, remember that that music video by Michael Jackson? Now I can do that, like, <laughs> instead of needing, like, a team of 100 engineers to, like, you know, do all this sort of graphics processing. This is me being turned into a bunch of different heads of state. Obama. Yeah. This is great, right? Like, I... It's my favorite. Okay, anyway. Uh, <laughs> so... Um, I, 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 maybe some of you saw FaceApp, which let you put smiles in people's faces. So I thought it would be really funny to do a, play a practical joke, which is take the smile filter and put another smile on that, you know, and then take the output of that and put another smile on that, and then just keep on running it over and over and over until basically it couldn't recognize a smile uh, like a face anymore. This is kind of what happens when you do when you run FaceApp repeatedly. <laughs> Another neat thing is, this is more recent, like you can uh, basically superimpose an image into another image, right? So like I'm placing Einstein into this crab nebula. So I thought it'd be really funny to like, s like basically photobomb Da Vinci and like, you know, Edward Muntz, there, there's me. Like, <laughs> this is so creepy, isn't it? Like, well actually, no. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So I was there. I was really, uh, <laughs> anyway, um, so uh, let's see, how am I doing? OK, great. I, I just made it. So I'm just going to tell you, I'm going to plug some, some work of mine that, that you might find interesting. So I'm really, uh, I really love sharing all my work. And like, like, like it was said, I do a lot of workshops. I've been doing workshops for the last few years and showing people how to have fun with machine learning. Because I find it's like the most you know, like um, fulfilling way of learning how this stuff works, really works. And basically, I've been making a lot of demos and open source software for playing with these things a little bit and um, putting them online. And uh, I basically made this collection of resources called ML uh, on this website, mlforay.github.io. And uh, there's lots of like uh, creative coding applications that show you how to do various things, organize your media libraries, run generative models, things like that. Um, this is some, some highlights of that. Also, like, there's a sort of book that I've been writing forever. Like, it's like just this sort of vanishing horizon as I try to finish this book. And, um, 
And there's a lot, lot of guides also, like instructional guides, kind of like instructables, like how do you do so and so, make a drawing application, uh, run the convolutional neural network, maybe do some reinforcement learning, things like that. And also demos. These are like JavaScript based demos. I'm a big supporter of a project that's going on right now called ML5.js, which is like JavaScript based client, client side in browser machine learning, makes it really, really easy to get started. Um, and so some of these are, are in there. And like I said, workshops, these are just some highlights from a bunch of my workshops. I keep a log of them on my website and you can kind of see the links. We had one here that was really, really well attended. It was amazing, like um, really, really, that was actually my biggest workshop ever. So thank you guys for having that. Um, and I also record a lot of my classes. So these are like, and they don't actually go this fast. They're much more reasonable. Um, but I just finished, uh, actually, like I just finished a class called Neural Aesthetic, which I taught at NYU. Um, this past fall, all of the lectures are recorded, and uh, all of the slides and the supplementary materials, everything is online. And so, if you're interested in hearing, like I know I go through a lot of these concepts very quickly, but if you're interested in like a deeper dive, there's like 30 hours of this basically in this in this website. I'll be teaching again this spring with a new class, a new concept coming up. And um, so yeah, I hope you guys tune into that. So you can find me at genecogan.com and on Twitter, Gene Kogan. And so thank you very much. Hi everyone, hopefully that should set the tone for my talk. Um, yeah, this is using Big GAN as, as, as Jean mentioned. Um, and so I'm going to talk about, before I get into the depths of what I've been doing for the last couple of years, which is going to be the, the main theme of my talk, I just want to give a brief overview of, of where I come from. Um, oh, it's playing very jerky, I'm not sure why. But anyway, so um, the idea here is to give a, a bit of context as to where I come from to give an idea of where I'm going. I'm a computational artist. I basically write software. To, that's the kind of medium that I work in. Um, so everything that you're seeing here is created through custom software. And the goal really is that as a visual artist, I got quite frustrated, say 10, 15 years ago, of the tools available to me um, in how to creatively express myself. I found it a very... Um, very non-real-time, very non-interactive process, especially working with kind of computer animation. And I was more inspired by the way musical instruments work and the way you have this real-time feedback loop between the, the creator and the system. So that's what I was always trying to create, systems that we can use to kind of extend the body. And that was the overarching theme that's evolved over the years, which is working with technology, not just as a tool, not just as a medium, but it became the subject matter, and how these emerging technologies become extensions of our body, how they become extensions of our mind, and how we relate to ourselves, how we relate to each other, and ultimately the impact on society and culture, and on ethics, on ritual, on tradition, and, and even religion. So, I started getting into machine learning because, like I said, everything here is effectively custom software, so I'm writing a function. I'm writing a function that will map some kind of input, which usually comes from a user, to some kind of output. And I became more interested in looking at different ways of designing that function. Um, so first I was working with computer vision, it's maybe like 10, 15 years ago, and that evolved into working with more sophisticated algorithms and eventually machine learning. So I'm here to give a few alternative perspectives um, on this thing that we call AI. And the title of my talk is Machines That Learn. What do they know? Do they know things? Let's find out. And, and more importantly, it's more about what can we learn from machines that learn. So very quickly, um, 
this is what AI looks like according to the internet. So I don't really use the term AI. I try to avoid as much as possible. Instead, I talk about machine learning, which, like I mentioned, given that we define some kind of function f that maps an input to an output, with machine learning, we try to infer what this function f should be given example data instead of handwriting this function f. And very quickly, I want to go through why I'm so interested in this. Um, we can also think of this as data-driven methods because we're designing behavior through data. And so I'm going to go back quite a bit to the 1800s with Charles Babbage, one of the key people in the development of general purpose computing. And he built these large mechanical computers, which we know mostly through the notes of Lady Ada Lovelace, which you might know as the world's first computer programmer. But she also had in her notes um, some beautiful foresight, centuries of foresight, where she said, for example, the analytical engine weaves algebraic patterns just as a jacquard loom weaves flowers and leaves. And one of her most profound insights was she saw the potential of these mechanical machines to go beyond just number crunching, um, but to operate on symbols and to do true general purpose computing. And she even went on to say, the engine might compose elaborate and scientific pieces of music of any degree of complexity or extent. And she wrote this in 1843, kind of foreseeing the, the generative computational art movement that we have today. But she, amongst these notes, she also said the most very oft quoted and somewhat controversial statement. The analytical engine has no pretensions whatever to originate anything. It can do whatever we know how to order it to perform. It can follow analysis, but it has no power of anticipating any analytical revelations or truths. Its province is to assist us in making available what we are already acquainted with. And for two centuries, we've been arguing about whether she's right or wrong, and here we are again talking about this. Um, and given the state of technology and knowledge in the 1800s, I totally agree with Lovelace. However, since then, there have been two world wars, a Cold War and a new model of business that relies on mass surveillance. And this has pushed technology in a direction which I think sheds some new light. So jumping a century forward in his seminal 1950 essay, Alan Turing also addresses this statement. Um, and he opens his seminal paper in 1950 with the question, can machines think? Again, we're debating this um, seven decades later. So he refers to this statement as Lady Lovelace's objection. And he proposes that in order for us to be able to consider a machine to originate anything, it has to surprise people, even its programmer. And he adds, machines take me by surprise with great frequency. Because two years prior, he had already theorized the idea that a machine could learn, um, something he called unorganized machines, loosely inspired by the neurons in the brain. And he goes on to propose, instead of trying to produce a program to simulate the adult mind, why not rather try to produce one to simulate the child's? If this were then subjected to the appropriate course of education, one would obtain the adult brain. And he adds, an important feature of a learning machine is that its teacher will often be very largely ignorant of quite what is going on inside. And this is simultaneously the most interesting and exciting aspect of machine learning, but also the most dangerous aspect. It's ultimately a technology that can enable us to see things that we might otherwise not be able to see. And it's likely that we will see things that once we see, we cannot be the same again. A bit like when Galileo took a lens and looked at the heavens and confirmed what Copernicus and Kepler had theorized, that Earth was not the center of the universe, we, society, could not be the same again. So this is machine learning. Um, it's about inferring that function f. It's a subfield of AI. And the subfield of machine learning is what we call deep learning, which is um, it's the current popular flavor of machine learning that we hear about today. And it's a flavor of machine learning that specializes in operating on very far, vast amounts of raw, raw high dimensional data, such as images and sounds, etc. And what the 10-year-old boy in me finds really fascinating about deep neural networks is when you pipe data through them, it is literally a journey through multiple dimensions in transformations in space and time, because each block is itself 
uh, a function. It's a non-linear, high-dimensional transformation, which is learning and extracting unique features from previous blocks to build a hierarchy of increasingly abstract representations. And amidst the depths of these representations is the great unknown. So uh, Jean already talked about Deep Dream, which means I don't have to go into the details of explaining how it works, which is great. Um, so I really, really love Deep Dream. But, but it's not the aesthetic that I love, it's the, the poetry of what's happening behind the scenes. So Jean explained what it does really, really well. Um, in a way, it's this neural network that's been trained to class recognize images, looks at my face, it doesn't know what it's seeing. Um, and there are certain activations which are firing quite weakly as it's recognizing, and then we amplify those activations by modifying the input image. So in a way, this is perhaps analogous to looking at a cloud and thinking that we see a rabbit. But the bit that I really love is people look at these images and say, oh, I see lots of puppies, lots of eyes, lots of slugs, lots of bird lizards. But actually, of course, there's no such thing. What's happening is when we look at this, which is effectively noise, we are trying to make sense of it. And we recognize, oh, maybe that looks like a bit of a bird, maybe that looks a bit like a, um, a bird lizard. So there are weak activations in our mind, and we are completing that loop of making meaning. The activations that were weak in the neural network are amplified in the image, and then we look at it and we get the same kind of um, neural activations. And we project back onto this output image effectively who we are and what we know. And this is what a lot of the research, my research is about right now, which is using machine learning algorithms to reflect on how we make sense of the world, and using machine bias as a way to reflect on our own self-affirming cognitive biases. Because ultimately, a trained neural network can take something like this, which is pure random white noise, put it through this journey through multiple dimensions and transformations in space and time, and produce this, which is still noise, but with a more particular distribution. And then we are machines that yearn for structure, and we project meaning onto them because that's what we do. That's what we've always done. That's how we survive in the wild. We invent stories, we make things up, and we believe them. And everything that we see or read we, even these sentences that I'm saying right now, we're trying to make sense of based on everything that you've read, everything that you've seen, um, all of your past experiences filtered through your prior beliefs and knowledge, just like Deep Dream or any other neural network. So um, I did many explorations in that realm. Um, this is one of them. Oh, hang on, sorry. locked up again. Anyway, so here there's a few, few, um, air, few threads actually that are connected. Going to the more practical, so my PhD is more about um, real-time expressive um, interaction, particularly working with generative deep neural networks to provide meaningful human control um, and continuous meaningful human control. So Again, the analogy is working, playing like a, a piano, where you sit down, there's a real-time feedback loop between you and the system, as opposed to, say, something like Photoshop, where, okay, it's a very, very powerful tool, but it lacks that immediate response. So, on one hand, that's what I'm researching in my PhD, and this is, you know, one of the um, research areas. You might have heard something like style transfer, which, again, Jean mentioned. This is not style transfer. With style transfer, you take one image, for example, a painting, and then you apply that to a photo. Um, this, is used, this is based on pics to pics that, again, Jean mentioned, where it's trained on tens of thousands of images. So it's somehow the network contains knowledge about the, the subject matter. Ooh, what's happened there? So, for example, with waves, it's learned what to do with foam. As I'm moving the, the cloth around, it, um, it knows where and how to put foam. But also going beyond that, connecting to the original theme, this neural network has been trained on tens of thousands of images, uh, for example, photos of waves. And now it's looking at my hands and my desk, and it's 
kind of trying to make sense of what it sees, but it can only make sense of what it sees through the context of what it's seen before. It's trying to reconstruct the, the webcam image through the features that it's learned from what it's been exposed to before. So it can only see what it already knows, just like us. So this next project is kind of, I try to distill that idea really, really down. It's not about AI or machine learning at all, but it's more about perception and cognition and, and human bias and, and the subjective experience. It uses uh, virtual reality as a technology, um, but I don't think it's really a VR piece. It's about as far from VR as one can get, as, as you'll see. So there's a few motivations. I won't read all of it, but um, the basic idea is that uh, what we perceive to be real is a reconstruction in our minds. Um, a simplified model of the world. Perception is an active process. It requires action and integration. The actions that we take affect the reality that we construct. And most crucially, even when presented with the same information, um, everybody will experience something unique, which we are not able to understand or perceive. And I'm interested in these themes on a perceptual level, uh, but also, like for example, with how vision works, but also on a much higher conceptual level, kind of metaphoric level, regarding how we make meaning, and particularly inspired by what's happening in the world politically. I'm from Turkey, um, which is currently kind of ripped in two over the current political situation. The UK, with what's happening in Brexit. Of course, the States is not having a great time in, ter in terms of unity either. So, um, I'll quickly skip to some of these things. It used to be thought that even people like Plato used to believe that vision happened, that we shot fiery rays out of our eyes and that coalesced with the material and solidified and that's how we had the sensation of, of seeing. Uh, extra mission theory of vision, it's, it's, it's a really nice theory actually, um, but of course it's wrong. It, that's not how vision happens. Light falls on the retina. But what I do like about the extra mission theory of vision is that it underlines the idea that vision is an active process, that we have to take an action and we have to look, and that's how we actually perceive the world. Um, the eye is not like a camera at all. We don't have lights fall on our retina and then take a snapshot photo. The bit that's actually high resolution and full color is, is tiny, the fovea, which is about you know the size of a thumbnail. And we we constantly saccade and scan the scene. Um, and you know, Alfred Yarbus in the 50s and 60s used this what looks like a torture device to do lots of eye scanning and even found that when you asked people to um, a question like what's happening in this painting? What, what are people wearing? How long was the guy away for? What are they talking about? This affects the way that we scan the scene. So the meaning that we take from a scene um, is determined by the actions that we take within that scene. So the final bit of information I'd like to give is this phenomenon known as the binocular rivalry, which has been known for centuries, which is the idea, which is a phenomenon that happens when the two eyes are presented radically different images. Um, the brain is unable to integrate those two images to pro pro provide um, a single cohesive 3D percept to our conscious awareness which is what usually happens. Right now, my two eyes provide a slightly different perspective on this scene, and so I have a 3D percept, a, a, a percept of this scene. So what happens is we get a bistable um, state. The two images are in the, well, in the nervous system somewhere, but my conscious awareness um, doesn't, uh, can't consume both images at the same time. In fact, instead what's presented is something similar to the image on the right. And I say similar because I don't actually know what any of you would see if that went to your left eye, that went to your right eye. I see something like what's on the right. Uh, furthermore, if the images are complete, completely static, the conscious visual experience is dynamic. So what happens is that mixed percept would be animating and morphing and doing all kinds of things. Um, and this is completely dependent on your physiology. So if I were to present these two images to your eyes, I, have, I am incapable of knowing what you see in your mind's eye. So FIGHT is a project that ex explores this. It's, it's an installation It looks a little bit like this, where I wanted it to be a little bit homely and a welcoming environment. 
um, but with a little bit of an airy um, something a bit uncomfortable about it as well. But really, I wanted to underline that you are about to go on a spiritual journey. Um, so it's, it looks a little bit like this. It's, it's a 10 minute journey that goes through various different um, states. Oh, why is this? Sorry. So um, one other interesting thing, so for example, you get things like this where right now there's no rivalry. Um, so wherever you look, the scene deforms. This was trying to underline the idea that seeing is an active process and the act of looking is affecting the meaning that you take. Um, there's no rivalry, so the image appears as an external scene the same way all of you feel external to me right now. But then as rivalry kicks in, um, an interesting phenomenon that happens is vision, at least in my experience and the people I've spoken to, ceases to be an external event, but the image jumps to feeling like it's physically located inside the head. So the, the image that you see in your head of what would happen when these are blended feels like it's here, which is of course how seeing actually always is. It's just that we forget that and we sometimes assume that what we're seeing out here is the ultimate uh, reality. So that was fight. Um, I've also worked a bit with text, uh, and it's a very interesting domain to also explore the intersection of machine bias and human bias. There are these models that we call embedding models that are very similar to what Jean mentioned with the, the GANs, where you can do mathematical operations. You can take these um, algorithms, train them on a huge corpus of text, for example, 100 billion words of Google News, and then it knows nothing about language, it doesn't know anything about um, grammar, it doesn't know about words or gender or tenses, but it learns all of these things. And the same way you could do like, mathematical operations, you can do operations like queen minus king plus man, and it will say woman. So it learns a vector in this high dimensional space for gender, or it will learn tenses, so swam minus swimming plus walking, and it will say walked or it'll learn the relationships between countries and their capitals, like Madrid minus Spain plus Italy will give you Rome. So I was curious, what else have these um, <coughs> models learned? So I wrote a few Twitter bots to explore this, and what happens is the Twitter bots picks completely random words, and it picks completely random arith arithmetic operations, and then it tweets the results. Um, so these are a few of my like, highly curated favorites. For example, I was quite blown away that if you add Twitter and bot, the result is a meme. But really, the, the essence of this project is not about what has the model learned, but also trying to tread that blurry boundary between what has the model learned versus like, what biases are in the model versus what biases am I introducing in trying to interpret the results. For example, nature minus God is dynamics. And I find that really, really beautiful. But is that because the model actually has any idea of what any of this stuff is, or is it me projecting what I believe about nature versus God versus dynamics? Because at the end of the day, the system will provide an answer no matter what question you give it. Human minus love is an animal. I mean, I could write a, an essay on that, but it could also be the result of a floating point error in, in the model. Like, I, I don't know. Another bot that I wrote was inspired by this very famous result. Um, from a few years ago, which is doctor minus man plus woman, and the result is apparently nurse. So the model has learned like this societal bias because it's trained on basically the internet. So I did another Twitter bot that again picks random words, looks at the vectors from man to that word and woman to that word, and tweets the results. Again, the results are very... I wrote a really long article about this, so if you I don't, can't go into it now, but if you look up word of math bias, you can find it. Um, again, there are some results which are perhaps very obvious, um, very obvious in that what it's learned from, uh, from the data set versus bias that we project back onto 
uh, the results. So I'd like to move on to the last stretch, which is about this, a few other threads that I'm really inspired by, um, which are focused around the recent explosion of AI, why we have it, and looking at that from a few different perspectives, especially considering that it comes after a phase of, of big data. You know, we were in a phase of big data, now we're in a phase of AI. And I find this really fascinating from a few different angles. The first one is, I like the metaphor relating the emergence of AI as a means of coping with big data, analogous to the Darwinian evolution of intelligence and even consciousness in biology, especially when vision evolved around 540 million years ago, and it brought about a requirement for mechanisms to manage this really rich sensory information so organisms could utilize the limited bandwidths in their neural pathways more efficiently and make more optimal decisions in if catching prey or evading predators. And ultimately, as many believe, this may have even kick-started the evolutionary arms race that we call the Cambrian explosion. And in even higher organisms, this may include learning to model the environment so as to make more accurate predictions and thus be more efficient in processing sensory input data. And going even further to be able to form any kind of social interaction, some organisms may even learn to model themselves and each other so that I can model and interact with any of you, not as billions of particles or as fluctuations in a quantum field or as a lump of organic cells, but as a thinking, feeling individual with goals and desires whereby your consciousness is like a high-level interface through which I can um, empathize with and my interface to you. So that's one perspective. But of course another perspective is the fact that it's no coincidence that the biggest funders and advocates of AI research, the people putting all the money behind all this research, are the very same whose business models depend on making sense of understanding big data. Likewise, the GCHQ, the NSA, have collected more data than they know what to do with, and they desperately need algorithms to process, compress, and understand that data and produce executive summaries for us. And that's why the bulk of this research is actually ultimately surveillance-related, which you know, we are all trying to reappropriate, but they are ultimately surveillance-related technologies. So I think it's safe to say that World War I gave us analog computers, World War II gave us digital computers, the Cold War gave us internet, and the mass surveillance of the war on terror and data-driven psychographic advertising is giving us deep learning and AI. But there's another perspective, which a nice transition from the pioneering nurse and statistician Florence Nightingale, bearing in mind that a lot of this deep learning is effectively computational statistics. And she goes on to say, to understand God's thoughts, we must study statistics, for these are the measure of his purpose. Because of the thousands of deities and beliefs and overseers that humanity has had over millennia, these overseers have always co-evolved to match the needs of its host society and culture. There's so many fascinating correlations between models of subsistence, social structures, values and ethics, with the qualities of the deities and the belief systems. There are fascinating perspectives on the current rise of AI and mass surveillance through the lens of the ultimate panopticon, that is religion the all-seeing eye of God. I'm fascinated by this new form, evolving form of overseer, because as we lose our spiritual sensibilities and we drown ourselves in materialism and technological submission, our overseer too is adapting and co-evolving. We don't fear the old gods anymore. They cannot protect or control us, so we need new ones. We have killed God, as Nietzsche says, but we are rebuilding him with technology to match our techno culture. And he lives up in the cloud of all places, watching over us, listening to our thoughts and dreams in ones and zeros. We are creating a digital god for our digital culture. But it doesn't even end there. This new overseer in the cloud not only watches us to protect the good and punish the bad, but now as it learns, it becomes more intelligent, it, be it makes decisions for us as well. It used to be that we started offloading our memory tens of thousands of years ago to you know, etchings in stone, pieces of paper, even personal computers. But it used to be that this um, medium that we used to offload our memory and thinking to, were, we were physically connected to. They were either on our body or we had physical access to. But now we don't even know where it happens. We use these things just as portals where we send 
our queries in using what these so-called cognitive APIs, using this new language of scripture that some of you might recognize as JSON, where we open a channel of communication with the cloud and we get our answers. And it doesn't even end there. It used to be that the churches of the old gods had taken upon themselves to be not only the bastions of morality, of right and wrong, but also the purveyors of art and culture, to be the inspirers, the storytellers and history makers, the commissioners and the funders. And now we have our AI companies moving into that space too. So inspired by all of this, I wrote a poem in 2014. It's a collaboration with Google. Uh, not people working at Google, but actual Google, the search engine because we have a very intimate connection with the cloud. We confide in it, we confess to it, we appeal to it, we share secrets with it that we wouldn't share with our closest family or friends. And Google is the keeper of our collective consciousness. It sees everything we see, knows everything we know, and feels everything we feel. So this poem is actually more a collection of prayers. And as you can see, I type a few words and Google uh, autocompletes based on what the world was feeling in, in 2014. So these are the prayers. Uh, yeah, millions of people around the world. So I had this realization a few years ago that all of my work was about waves or God, or somehow about both, and more broadly speaking, the intersections of science and spirituality. I think that's what I, um, I come to. Because I think when I use the term waves, I mean, what I mean is the patterns in nature which we humans have managed within our limited cognitive abilities to collectively recognize, decipher, and formalize into equations and theories, often that we find elegant and beautiful. And when I use the term God, I think I mean those mysterious aspects of nature we have, which we have yet to understand, and the lengths that we will go to, the stories that we will tell to try and make sense of it all. And with the term quantum mechanics, I mean the fringes of human knowledge which we empirically know to be relatively accurate and we can understand through the language of mathematics, but we are unable to comprehend what it really means on a, on a human level. So this is a space that I'm ultimately uh, you know, really interested in exploring. And I'll, very, I'll close with just quickly going over a few very recent works that I haven't even managed to fully um, collect all the um, documentation yet. This is a collaboration with Yenna Sotella, the artist Yenna Sotella, supported by Somerset House and Google Arts and Culture. It's called Nimia Chetty. It's an audiovisual work inspired by in experiments in interspecies communication. The idea is using state-of-the-art technology, in this case machine learning, to give a bowl of bacteria a voice to translate its movements into sounds and symbols. And it builds upon the works of the 19th century French medium Helen Smith, uh, known by the surrealist as the muse of automatic writing, which who, she, amongst other things, she would enter a trance and channel uh, a distant civilization on the planet Mars. And she could channel their thoughts and receive messages in what she believed or claimed was their native language, Martian. And she spoke in this tongue, this glossolalia. So in our work, the computer becomes the shaman, um, where we worked with the text, worked with that voice, and we explored ways of translating the movements of this bowl of bacteria into the sounds and symbols. And a completely unrelated, but coincidentally, it ended up being lots of similar themes. Another, another work I'd like to talk about is um, Ultra Chunk, also supported by Somerset House, also a collaboration uh, with Jennifer Walsh, a vocal performer. And here we were interested what would happen if a machine just watched someone for a year. So there was a big ritualistic aspect to this where Jennifer would, no matter where she was in the world, which as a touring musician was all over the world, Every day, she would sit in front of her computer and improvise for five minutes at least. And we collect tens of hours of data of her voice improvising, but also the face that would make that voice. And then we trained uh, a bunch of networks on this. And the result of the piece is this um, improvisational performance where both the machine and Jennifer are responding to each other. They're listening, they're improvising, they're responding to each other. And I'm actually also side stage here. Um, 
I liken my role to that of a lion tamer, where I've trained the machine for a year, and now we're going live, and I'm there with my whip, making sure that the machine stays within the boundaries of what we deem to be acceptable behavior, uh, and even trying to encourage the machine into desirable spaces. So, yeah, for some reason, once I play a video, it freezes and I have to quit and go back in. So, bear with me, I'm just coming to the end. So, how much time do I have left? I'm out of time, aren't I? Okay, I'll skip to the very end. So, um, I'd like to end on a very, very important note. Um, this is, yeah, my last slide. It's the single most important slide, really, which is, you know, the, the key message, what about the future, of all the possible futures, which is the one that's awaiting us. And I think... Oh, shit. Um, I'm only kidding. I don't use Windows. Um, and, yeah, I have no idea what future is awaiting us. I have no idea the answer to that question. Um, but I can say that I think I know what, what I would prefer. And that is to quote the, the great thinker Wonder Woman, uh, which I watched a film on the plane over here. Technology is like any other power. Without reason or without heart, it will only destroy us. So I think ultimately the future that we'd like to build should have more heart. And only then can we start making progress which doesn't only benefit a small group but can be more broader in the sense that we are not realizing the high costs of what we call progress and this can happen if we try to get away from what Ursula Franklin refers to the culture of compliance where we try to shift values towards prioritizing the, the well-being of, well, of, all live, of all living creatures and of all living things. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you for listening.